hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving and uh, appreciate everyone joining us on the first day back. I'm sure those are always busy days <laughs> after a holiday weekend. So great to have everybody. We'll have this recorded also uh, for folks uh, who were not able to attend. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, so welcome to our uh, webinar, Educator to Educator webinar on best practices for using the aquifer geriatrics uh, across the curriculum. Um, my name is Amit Shah. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Aquifer Geriatrics. Uh, I'm also a, a Dean of Faculty Affairs and currently the Interim Dean of Student Affairs at the Mayo Clinic Alex School of Medicine uh, on our Arizona campus. We'll be joined today by Dr. Ravi Ramaswamy, um, who's an Associate Professor and a Clerkship Director at Mount, the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Dr. Andrea Schwartz, um, who is the Director of Aging and the End of Life Care theme at the Harvard Medical School and is one of our Associate Editors. Uh, Ravi, uh, Dr. Ravi Ramaswamy is our assessment lead for aquifer geriatrics. Uh, and then uh, uh, Dr. Rachel Miller, who is uh, uh, an associate professor uh, at the University of Pennsylvania's uh, Perlman School of Medicine and has been a case author and has recently published on using uh, the aquifer geriatrics cases during the time of COVID. So welcome to our, to our group and welcome to you all. Um, we have some disclosures. Uh, those of us who are editors, um, uh, Dr. Dr. Ramaswamy, Dr. Schwartz, and myself receive an annual honorarium for our work. And, and Dr. Uh, Miller, who has been a case author, has uh, earned fame and glory, but, but no, no funds for her amazing work on, on, uh, on aquifer uh, geriatrics over the years. So uh, today, what we're going to do is explore uh, the full scope of aquifer geriatrics teaching and learning tools. Uh, we know that uh, the majority of people on the call have um, have uh, are currently using, uh, but we also know that uh, aquifer geriatrics, but we also know that there are others who are not using or who are only using it minimally. Uh, and so hopefully this will allow you to get the most out of your uh, current uh, subscription. Um, we'll talk about some practices for engaging learners with aquifer geriatrics that you may not have thought about um, that other schools are using. Uh, and then we'll answer your questions uh, and point you to some additional resources uh, regarding aquifer geriatrics. So uh, uh, we'll do, uh, I'll do, start with, we've done introductions, we'll do a course overview, we'll talk about some hidden gems, and then uh, our, our other uh, presenters will talk about use of aquifer geriatrics in flipped classrooms and virtual teaching to teach the teachers and with early and late learners. And we'll have plenty of time for question and answers here at the end. Um, so uh, as you all know, this is kind of that webinar format, you're automatically muted, uh, but we do want this to be interactive. And so please do put your uh, questions in the question and answer panel. Uh, the chat is fine to use also, but we prefer that you use um, uh, the question and answer panel um, to, uh, to highlight things. So first, before we start, just a little bit of aquifer for the people who are not familiar with what aquifer is. Um, aquifer is a not-for-profit organization dedicated to advancing healthcare education. And it's really just a consortium of educators. That's why we call this an educator to educator uh, webinar, uh, made up uh, usually of people who have been teaching uh, medical trainees and learners are across all of our institutions uh, uh, here in the United States, but we have an increasing presence of international um, uh, subscribers also. Um, we, uh, each of the course boards collabs, collaborates with their national organizations, and we have done exactly the same here in geriatrics to determine what we, what we should, should teach. Um, the subscription dollars are reinvested into development and maintenance of content and some grants um, for educators to use the, uh, uh, also. Aquifer has had a banner year. Um, the pandemic has uh, allowed Aquifer to play a really unique role in medical education um, with uh, moving uh, Aquifer to uh, a, a free and uh, a model during the height of the pandemic and allowing people to use uh, this for that immediate transition to virtual learning that occurred at many of our institutions. Um, we have had uh, uh, almost 2 million cases uh, completed in the 2019 and 2020 uh, year um, and aquifer, uh, formerly known as MedU, is, is used by 90, 95% of all of the allopathic uh, medical schools who subscribe to at least one of the courses. Um, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a tremendous resource for us uh, across the country and, 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 and this year really proved that. So we'll start off with a little poll. Um, and, and Megan, if you could start our poll, uh, what learners are using aquifer geriatrics at your program? So let's go ahead and start that poll. So preclinical learners, clinical learners, in other words, like medical, PA, and NP students, et cetera, residents or fellows, or, or you know, post 
you know, uh, 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 initial training um, uh, students, uh, staff or faculty development, practicing clinicians, um, or not using aqua for geriatrics currently. And uh, Megan, you can go ahead and stop the poll whenever you think we've had enough uh, respondents. All righty, survey says, so we've got mostly people using it with clinical learners, um, a few that are using it with residents and fellows and, and one person who's not using it currently at all. Um, uh, and so we'll talk a little bit more about using it with some of these other groups of learners because I think there are some opportunities here for you all to do that. All right, so let's start off with just a little course um, overview. First of all, how did Aquifer Geriatrics start? Aquifer Geriatrics was initially called uh, web gems or web-based geriatric education modules. And it was designed um, uh, to link into the national geriatrics education competencies um, uh, that were developed um, uh, some years ago. Uh, and just like the other courses, we tied all of our cases to those national uh, competencies that we felt every medical student should know before they start residency. Um, the Donald W. Reynolds Foundation had funded a lot of geriatrics education at many institutions across the country, um, and they funded the development of this uh, course initially. We, from the very beginning, copied the MedU Aquifer mod model using uh, the exact same way that cases were created, uh, recognizing that this was a winning model and one that students really liked, so we might as well copy it. Um, uh, and, uh, and we were giving them, uh, and we, we initially developed and had free case access on the portal of geriatrics online education. After grant funding expired, um, uh, the American Geriatric Society and our uh, academic uh, uh, arm uh, called ADGAP approached MedU to add web gems to our library of courses and to ensure that it would be maintained, updated, and really been brought up to uh, MedU full standards. Um, uh, and so in 2017, we moved WebGems to MedU and then MedU became Aquifer the final, the following year. And all of the case names, like of course names like Simple and Clip and other things became just internal medicine, pediatrics, and we became geriatrics to make it very clear of what the courses were about. This is our current course board, though we have many others um, who have been case authors and, and editors over the years. Dr. Roseanne Leipzig is our senior director, um, and we have a group, a, a fantastic group of teaching and learning leads and uh, associate editors that are uh, displayed here on this slide. And you're meeting some of them here today. So let me go ahead and, and do a case walkthrough because I think there's that's probably going to be the best way for you all to really see what a case uh, looks like. And we'll start off with just how you would actually um, um, assign a case or, or find out what case you would want to assign. So. Um, here is, uh, uh, if everyone can see the screen here okay, um, you'll, uh, you'll, when you log into Aquifer, you'll come into this page over here. I'm in the faculty view over here and you'll see educator resources, student um, uh, learning resources, uh, etc. And then a listing of all the cases that your institution subscribes to. The best way that I think that you can have to look at a case given a, a topic, usually we as educators say, I wanna teach about, let's say dementia, go over to case library and have that load up. Um, and then you'll see that you can either search for some very specific topic areas, uh, diagnoses, age groups, et cetera, or you can even do a free text search, which I'll show you, you here today. So let's say I wanna teach about dementia, pretty common geriatric topic. And you can see here the cases, not just in geriatrics, but a family medicine case that covers dementia. And of course, there are several aquifer geriatrics cases, no surprise, that have patients with dementia or dementia mentioned. Um, you can see here by the highlights that it's not just listed somewhere in the case or the case synopsis. For many of these cases, it's in the learning objectives. And you could click over and actually look at the learning objectives to see, well, what do they talk about? Ah, this one talks about differentiating key features of dementia. So it's really quick for you as a faculty member to be able to find what cases you do want to create. And we've got great tutorials on the Aquifer website about how you create custom courses, uh, et cetera. So for one co course that I have right now that uh, I teach, I assign just one uh, Aquifer geriatrics case. So I've created a, I'm gonna talk about this here a little bit later uh, on advanced care planning. And this is the case I'm gonna demo for you all here. So. We'll click on the case here and you'll see this is kind of, you know, it would open up one by one, but um, the, the case starts off immediately with a patient uh, example. 
um, uh, you know, gets students engaged typically very, uh, uh, very quickly with some sort of a question. Um, uh, with this one is a matching question about different advanced directives and what they are and what uh, with some definitions just to get students started. Um, and then, um, uh, and then there's always these teaching points that that are key take homes uh, for the students um, that 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 uh, that they would want. Um, then there are different uh, parts of the case, including more discussion management. Um, there's some nice figures that talk about trajectories of illness in this case that teach a lot of clinical reasoning, which is a really nice part of all of the aquifer cases across all 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 of the course boards that, uh, that, that really emphasize clinical reasoning um, and then teach some very specific skills. Uh, for example, some of the aquifer cases can be used for teaching communication skills. Um, and, uh, and this is a good example in this one with a values history. And it includes a video uh, which uh, students can watch. How did you feel, Ty Diane? I'm so glad that you're out of the hospital and doing better. Yeah, you know, it was it was really an ordeal. It was it was really scary. I'm so great. And I'm not going to play the whole thing, but you got an idea that there's just a little bit of a, a video, and then it talks a little bit about how one takes a values history, uh, etc. So it walks the students through uh, step by step. Uh, and at the end of each case is a case summary, which some students don't know about or some faculty don't know about, which is a nice take home um, sort of summary of the case. Uh, the key knowledge aspects, the learning objectives, which the student didn't necessarily have at the beginning, the faculty did, um, are all listed at the top. So the students know what they were supposed to learn. All of those teaching points are right in here all summarized for the student and they can print this off and take it with them or save it you know, as a PDF uh, for them. And it talks about different aspects um, all in, all in a, a nice concise document with some of the key references here at the end. So, so this is a nice little, little aspect of, uh, of, of a quick run through through the cases. So you have an idea of, uh, of, of what the things look like. Students can provide feedback you know, in a five-star way with some specific comments. Um, about it being a valuable use of their time, uh, apply what they learn to patient care, and that they would recommend this case to another student or not. And typically these cases take, um, they vary from case to case across all the aquifer cases, but our average is a little bit less than 30 minutes a case. If a student does it, follows everything, you know, takes, takes it seriously. Some students who read more quickly may get through it in 20 minutes. Some maybe in up to 40 minutes in some of our cases, um, but you'll find that, that, that um, that it's they're they're very they're well received. We have good good uh, good evaluations from students about the cases, and we respond to the feedback from students as we review these on an about year to year and a half basis. Um, things. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and go back to um, the um, uh, the slides here. So um, there are a couple of, of gems that you may not be aware of that are really helpful. So we looked over at the, um, the case summary, um, which is a great teaching tool. Um, but there's also a section here called educator resources. So if you click on educator resources, you'll find this educator guide for all of our, our signature courses. And, um, and you'll find a little one pager that talks about, this is for faculty members, you know, what is the case? What's the synopsis? What's the differential? What are the learning objectives? And in this educator guide, there is this table right over here, which talks about what cases that, are, that we think would be great for a clerkship. Now, of course, some schools have geriatrics clerkships or a specific geriatrics experience at NP and PA schools. And so, of course, all of the cases would be quite appropriate. But for most schools, they don't have a, a dedicated geriatrics clerkship. And so there may be another model for you to incorporate the cases across clerkships. So here we have ones that are appropriate for internal medicine, for neurology, for psychiatry, for OBGYN, like an incontinence case, uh, um, for surgery with an abdominal pain in the elderly case, um, for doctoring, those early clinical uh, things, for palliative care, and specifically for disciplines. So there's uh, some cases on restraints, which would be great for nursing programs, uh, uh, et cetera. And so we've included even by disciplines uh, when that is appropriate, like rehab or PT, et cetera. Um, we also have um, a specific case, this column right here says osteopathic medicine. You can see case number 11 is a specific osteopathic case. So if we I know we had a few folks from osteopathic medical schools that had joined us, but that is also, I think, something that's hidden. You may not be aware of 
the fact that we have a case that goes over osteopathic manipulative medicine. And I've learned a little bit about osteopathic medicine, having to uh, be one of the editors on these cases. And we defer and have expert editors who are osteopaths to, to help us with that. And it's a pretty good case. Another wonderful thing we have is something called a geriatrics glossary. So when there is repeated things like activities of daily living or other things like that, um, they are all referenced in this thing called the geriatrics glossary. So students can go back to this um, and, and reference it separately. Um, and so this is located in the student resources section and something that you might use and review with your students. Um, uh, but rather than repeating things over and over again, there are link outs to the geriatrics glossary. So if a student hasn't heard about activities of daily living and other cases that they've done, they can go in here and, and, and uh, learn more about it. You can see how many of our cases refer to this um, uh, specific um, uh, part. As a faculty member for all of the aquifer cases, you can track your, um, your students' progresses. And, and so you can see here a course report. So for that a custom course that you would create, you can then say, okay, I assigned this many cases, how many cases have my student uh, done here. Jake Jackson has done two cases, gotten 26% through this and didn't start this one yet. So you can in one glance have a good idea of whether your students are on track or on progress for having completed their cases. Um, and then we're going to be having uh, starting this winter uh, and I've already started putting into some of the cases some great uh, self-assessment questions um, to match kind of what the other aquifer cases have at the very end of each case. So you have kind of some, you know, summative self-assessment questions. These are not meant to be high stakes, but we all know how much our students love doing uh, questions and answers and will spend, you know, hours doing uh, UWorld and other, other uh, subscription questions and answers. So this provides them some additional value uh, and to see whether they've understood what was taught um, in that case. So we're pretty excited about that. So um, I'm done with kind of the, the show and tell part of it. And now we're gonna move into specific ways that you can use Aquifer at, at geriatrics at your program. So that's what our next poll is gonna ask, um, you know, specific ways of teaching that you have used in trying to use Aquifer um, uh, cases. Um, so go ahead and start that poll up. I don't know if it's popped up yet. Um, there we go. So, um, so you see here, um, are you using them as flipped classroom? Are you using them as a boot camp or an orientation, let's say for a fellowship or for a newly hired nurse practitioner? Are you using them for independent study, team-based learning as part of an integrated curricular thread? Uh, did you use them or have you used them to make up for clinical experiences lost due to COVID or to replace did didactics um, for remediation? Or, or maybe you haven't used them for any of these purposes, you just assigned them traditionally. So Megan, you can go ahead and close the poll whenever there are enough responses. Survey says, all righty, wow. So 62% of you have used it to make up for lost clinical experiences due to COVID. Um, some are using them just for independent study and some as part of integrated curricular thread, um, but, but maybe not for some of these other things. So I think this next section is gonna be really helpful for us as we go through some of the ways that you can use or consider using aquifer geriatrics in your program. So let's go ahead and we'll start with Dr. Ravi Ramaswamy who has been using um, aquifer geriatrics in a flipped classroom model uh, in his clerkship. So uh, Dr. Ramaswamy. Thank you all for joining this webinar. Uh, it's really exciting for me to share how we've used aquifer geriatrics uh, at Mount Sinai. So I'm, I'm a co-director for the ambulatory care geriatrics clerkship uh, at the Icon School of Medicine. And we have 18 students that spend six weeks with us every six weeks uh, for a total of about 140 students, third year medical students every year. Students spend Mondays through Thursdays at their clinical sites, uh, which is a variety of experiences in outpatient geriatrics, inpatient geriatrics, inpatient palliative care consults, and a small amount of time in uh, uh, nursing home and home care as well. And Fridays are spent mostly in uh, small groups, case presentations by students discussing social determinants of health and uh, in didactics in the afternoons. Like you, we use a variety of teaching formats. 
you know, classroom teaching, we've used case-based discussions um, and uh, online aquifer modules as independent learning. Certainly things have changed since the pandemic and we can talk a little bit about that. Um, so what, how, how are we using aquifer modules? Uh, like I said, as independent learning materials for students, particularly for topics that we are not able to cover in didactics. In the past, we've used, for instance, the modules on elder abuse. We've used uh, a module for prognosis and screening, which is really helpful. We've also used it as an alternate learning experiences for students who may have missed clinical experiences, like a lot of you endorsed uh, due to the COVID pandemic. Uh, to make up for some of the clinical uh, loss of clinical experience or a missed didactic. We've also noticed over the past few years that uh, traditional classroom teaching does not always correlate with student satisfaction. And so one of the ways in which we've used aquifer modules uh, is uh, in a flipped classroom. So like you can see in this schematic on the right, a flipped classroom is a, is a kind of a blended learning uh, instructional strategy where the, the content is delivered, uh, unlike a traditional classroom, it is delivered outside of class, before class, often in an online format, much like, like an aquifer module, so that you can use the in-class time to do more hands-on, practical, skill-based uh, activities and skill building. Um, I will recommend you review what one of our, my colleagues uh, uh, did, Dr. Samantha Lau, who um, has published this blog post on the aquifer website, what she did over her course of uh, her fellowship year with the hazards of hospitalization and didactic. As you can imagine, this is a topic that has a lot of teaching points and uh, challenging to cover in an hour long didactic. So she did many iterations over the course of the year and uh, you know, using the aquifer module as, as, uh, as pre-work and then utilizing classroom time to have students prognosticate using e-prognosis or you know, doing, um, uh, using the confusion assessment method to practice that to, to diagnose delirium, et cetera. One of the other things I wanted to share in terms of a flipped classroom is our use of uh, the, the, the case 12 on falls. And traditionally we have used a case-based didactic which talks about you know, the definition of falls, the epidemiology, it presents an unfolding case and uses multiple choice questions at the end, it's still a lot of material. What we've noticed is some of the pitfalls of this kind of presentation is that um, students often have different prior clinical experiences. And so they come with varying um, amounts of experience, let's say on, on falls. And so you, you, you run the risk of getting some of the students uh, disinterested over the course of the, of the didactic. Um, and it's a lot of material in a small amount of time. So in the next slide, we'll show what we've done with the falls didactic, where we've had the students complete case number 12 prior to coming to the class, so that when they come in, they've already learned about some of the questions they would ask a patient with falls or at risk for falls. They would have already begun to appreciate the multifactorial causation of falls before they come into the class. So that then in the didactic time, we have focused on a variety of things. So here are some of the things we've tried uh, over the last one year. So we've focused on skill development and knowledge application using props. Uh, here in the, in the picture on the left, you can see one of our fellows who is teaching a student about the, the various indications of using an assistive device in someone with gait instability. So we've also used a, 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 a matching game uh, that was thanks to POGOE to help students understand the different indications of a variety of assistive devices. In another iteration, we've used uh, a recent article to teach students about evidence-based medicine style in a journal club style didactic. And most recently, what I've done is done role play and students really appreciate role play a lot where I play the, the, a patient that has recently fallen and students go, uh, you know, ask questions uh, to the patient and then receive feedback in real time about what, what they did well and what they did not. Has been extremely valuable to us uh, in teaching about history taking in false patients. So in terms of outcomes, we've learned that, next slide, we, we've really had some wonderful outcomes in terms of student engagement. You can see in the picture here, we've divided students into small groups. They're all engaged in small group activity 
a lot of peer learning going on here. Through use of post-session online surveys, we've also showed some improvement in student satisfaction. You'll see in the comments at the bottom of the slide. And then we've also been trying to work on improving student competency or measuring student competency in geriatric assessment skills through the use of OSCEs and direct observation by standardized patients. So that is something that is work in progress at this time. So you can see that the comments on the left have been in the in the pre-flipped classroom era and on those on the right have really improved in terms of uh, their engagement, student engagement, and how much they've appreciated how the content is being delivered. So I'll close by some of the tips that I can, I can offer from, from our experience with this kind of work is to um, keep your pre-work as short as possible, preferably 10 to 15 minutes. All of the aquifer modules generally run 20 to 25 minutes at most, which is a fantastic way of, of, of uh, getting the content to students. I also recognize that student learning preferences and styles change with time every few years. And so it's nice to receive student feedback when you're making changes to your curriculum. And I've also really appreciated involving uh, fellows and junior faculty in, in, the, in the teaching and bringing in new ideas each time you make a little change to your curriculum. And uh, with that, I think I will transition to um, Dr. Rachel Miller from uh, UPenn, who's, who will talk about her virtual clerkship uh, during the COVID pandemic. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. So like many of you, we were um, we had to deal with students who no longer had clinical opportunities uh, during the beginning of COVID. And so actually at our medical school at Penn, we do not have a geriatrics clerkship, um, but a variety of different educators were asked to create um, basically virtual electives during that time. So we were super excited in geriatrics. We seized this opportunity and we said we are going to use this to create some geriatrics um, curriculum. So we titled this the five ends and more. Um, and it was a geriatric course in teaching about older adults in uh, COVID. I have to say it was uh, on a side note, it was really important that we put COVID into this title because we were competing against other COVID electives at the time. And it certainly helped us to get buy-in for students who, um, who wanted to choose our elective. All right, next slide. All right, so I'll just give a little, um, I'll give an overview. And of course, anybody can ask sort of questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A at the end. So this was a two week course. Um, uh, we ran it uh, one time, we had a mixture of MS2s, MS3s and one MS4. And I think what's most important about what we did is that we structured this to have a combination of different learning modalities. About 20% was synchronous with um, small group sessions and virtual sessions with faculty and we used our geriatric fellows and the rest, was, the rest of it was asynchronous learning. Um, we structured the course around the geriatric five M's, mind and mentation, medications, mobility, matters most and multi-complexity. And this framework really helped us because in a two week period, although it seems long, time goes very, very quickly for everything that we wanna teach about older adults and aging um, and geriatrics. So this really helped keep us structured. So each day or day and a half was devoted to one of these topics. And then what we did was we used a combination of aquifer cases. Um, we used readings, podcasts, case-based um, small groups. We had some assignments and reflections. And again, we had a few, we had about four virtual teaching sessions with faculty. As far as faculty time, we had two geriatricians and we did involve our geriatric fellows. We had two geriatric uh, fellows involved as well. Next slide. So uh, how we use the aquifer cases. So they were integrated into the combination curriculum. Um, and like was said earlier, we were able to look at the topics and see what we had and decide which aquifer cases that we wanted best to use. And of course that would differ for everyone, um, but we chose a variety of, of six cases. Um, we were able to track the case completion on aquifer. And then in addition to the cases, like we said, we had another assignment or reflection that was combined with them. We needed to fill up the time in a meaningful way. So we wanted to make sure that we added um, you know, in, important and different types of learning opportunities for the students. And we also encourage them to work together. 
One of the things that we did use to our advantage is that we had a learning system, um, which we used Canvas. So they were able to post, read each other's posts. We were able to read assignments and we were able to respond either as a group or to personally, because um, we wanted to make sure that on days that we weren't getting together virtually, that they knew that they were one, that they were accountable and two, that we cared and that we might have something important to say, you know, for what they posted or what they put. Next slide. So here's just an example of a couple of days that I wanted to show you of what we do. So example for day three, we had a recorded lecture of a dementia overview. Again, this is probably about 10 minutes long. We used a podcast, we used some popular podcast sites um, and we used one on dementia diagnosis and management. We used an Aquaphor case, the one on dementia case four. And then we actually had a virtual discussion where we had large groups um, together. We were able to have breakout rooms um, when we discussed some geriatric cases. And we, again, we linked it um, appropriately to COVID-19. And then um, in day six, another example, um, again, sort of thinking about learning about the interdisciplinary team. There was a great podcast on interdisciplinary team in the hospital. We used the Aquaphor Geriatrics 23 case, Hazards of Hospitalization. We actually had a discussion board um, where they would ask questions that they wanted to know about their interdisciplinary colleagues. So, you know, a common one is what does PT do versus OT? You know, what is a case manager or a social worker? Um, and that was a great opportunity that we had them reply to each other and then we also replied to. Um, and then we had a virtual discussion where actually we had assigned in different, we had broken them into small groups and we had assigned them to different sites of care. So we might've had a group of three or four uh, making uh, one or two PowerPoint slides on nursing home. Another might've been an assisted living. One could have been a senior center. We had a, a, a long list of different sites of care community um, programs. And then we came together and they presented them um, and they got to talk about them. Next slide. Um, so outcomes, I think, um, as you can see here, and you're free to look at the paper, um, it was you know, very well received. They thought the course was really well organized. The objectives were clear. We did get a lot of feedback that they liked the structure with the five M's, that that really worked, that was concrete and worked for people. Um, they thought they 74% liked the discussions, 83% agreed the Aquaphor cases enhanced learning. 74% agreed group activities enhanced learning, and 87% agreed that large group virtual meetings enhanced learning. In fact, during, you know, we were constantly asking for feedback and we realized pretty quickly that they liked the virtual sessions. They actually liked the synchronous. So we actually changed one sort of immediately. We had one, I believe it was on polypharmacy and deprescribing. We changed that to a synchronous session that we were together because we wanted to add another one. So we were taking in that feedback. Um, another thing we did was actually they all called an older adult. Um, we had sort of a list of message uh, um, questions for them to ask. And this was sort of, this was actually under what matters most. Um, they loved that. And then we had a small group discussion. That's something actually I've continued for medical students. Um, we're doing that now. Um, these are just some other comments here. I loved how it taught the fundamental geriatrics while drawing on good examples in the current pandemic. I like the focus on community resources. This is something that's really important to me. I think that they really don't learn that. So it was definitely weaved all throughout because um, especially you know, with COVID-19 and, um, and all everything else going on, especially in our community of Philadelphia, I thought that was really important. And again, they really liked the selections of the readings and the cases in the podcasts. Next. Um, so tips and advice, uh, the multimodal format works. It keeps learners engaged. Um, pick aquifer cases that best complement your goals and objectives. And I think, you know, create more synchronous options, um, especially for complex topics. So again, like we realized they wanted another synchronous option. And then we looked and we said, you know what? Talking about deprescribing and polypharmacy is going to be much better for us to do that um, synchronous than for them to do it sort of in small groups or on their own. Um, but they did really like the combination of doing that together. So, and any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I'm happy to answer. Thank you. So I'm, I'm next. I'm Dr. Andrea Schwartz. And, and thank you, Dr. Miller, for that a terrific presentation, very inspiring to hear how you implemented this elective for, for your medical students during COVID. Um, I'm speaking about using aquifer geriatrics to teach the teacher. And I'm gonna give a couple of examples. 
The first is using it to teach the, those future geriatricians and people who are going to be content experts in this area. Um, in our uh, geriatrics fellowship program at Harvard Medical School, we have a training program to teach all of our fellows how to teach, where we teach them ways to make their, their learning engaging and to connect with their learners and build on what they already know. And one of the principles we teach them is about the importance of flipped classroom learning and not spending so much time in person lecturing, um, but rather using the time in person to make things engaging and find out what your learners already know and what questions they have. And so uh, we've been able to give our fellows access to aquifer geriatrics, both as a tool for them preparing their own teaching. Teaching, um, and also as a way for them to close any gaps in their own learning, uh, because they all come from very variable backgrounds um, and levels of preparation in terms of how much geriatrics they had in medical school or residency. And we've allowed our fellows to do it in a very self-directed way. Um, when fellows ro rotate with me, I have the opportunity to ask them about their strengths and weaknesses and what they want to learn more about and have an easy way to direct them to a resource that I know is up to date that will will show them the literature. I can encourage them to look at the deep dives and read the original papers um, in an aquifer case. So unlike a student who's maybe trying to get through it in 20 minutes, a fellow could use an aquifer case to learn about a particular topic and really go through the deep dives to get a sense of some of the classic papers or updated literature in that area. Now, one of the nice things about using aquifer as a resource for fellows is it allows them to close gaps in their own learning in a very self-directed way that's discreet. Uh, it's not putting them on the spot. Some programs actually assign the cases to their fellows as a sort of boot camp during their orientation to make sure that they've gone through all the cases, they have some basic geriatric knowledge in all these areas that they may previously not have learned. Um, so that, that is one example. And on the next slide, I'll give you the example of how we use aquifer geriatrics as a potential resource for faculty development. Now at most medical schools, there are very few geriatricians teaching geriatrics. And so we collaborate. Um, and I imagine this is similar at many different um, uh, health profession schools where the folks teaching about dementia or falls or polypharmacy may not necessarily have had specialty training themselves. And Aquifer can be a terrific resource for teaching the teacher by making it available for faculty to review prior to teaching the students. If students are assigned the cases, it also allows faculty to skim through and get a sense of what are the students learning? What's language that we're using to teach the students? Um, language about the heterogeneity of aging, um, that if you've seen one 80 year old, you've seen one 80 year old and, and that pattern recognition can be uh, misleading in older patients. So that's an example of having that resource available for faculty, even if you just give them the case summary um, can help them know what their students have learned and be able to build on what they have already learned. And again, with faculty, it can be uncomfortable to suggest that a faculty member may not have the knowledge about deep prescribing that, that we, um, would want in teaching this topic to trainees. And the fact is that that's a topic that may not have been taught when that faculty was in training. And so here we have a discreet way for the faculty member to get up to speed uh, without um, needing to figure out on their own, well, what paper should I read? Uh, because the cases are peer reviewed annually, they really are kept up to date. And um, so it's, it's a terrific way to help faculty all get on the same page. On the next slide, uh, I'll just share a couple of reactions we've had with some of our learners who've used aquifer geriatrics in a teach the teacher setting. Uh, so uh, in my clinic, we have our trainees take turns doing teaching in our post-clinic huddle on various topics. And one of our fellows used the aquifer case to help prepare her teaching, help figure out which resources to look at and up-to-date resources. And she found that it was so helpful to have an overview of the topic that was much more fun to go through and um, really user-friendly and filled with helpful tables and things that she can incorporate into her teaching. So really nice resource there. And then our faculty, once they see it, they're really excited about having this as a resource, both for their own teaching and for their own learning. And so that's been just a wonderful resource. I do see a question in the chat about boot camp recommendations for geriatrics fellowships. And I think part of this depends on the type of fellowship you're in and, and the, the backgrounds of your fellows. Um, but it is something that you could assign to your fellows within the first few weeks of fellowship, you know, do a few cases a week and set aside time to ask questions and review any 
the questions that come up. If you have your fellows, we got individual subscriptions for our fellows because we're using it in a self-directed way. Um, and so we don't have that faculty view of who has done which cases and what their performance was. If you did want to use it as part of, for example, helping fellows prepare for in-training exams and identify areas of strength and, strength and weakness, then getting a program subscription would allow you as the faculty member to have a sense of where your, your fellows are. So on the next slide, I just have some tips on uh, using Aquifer to teach the teacher. So you could consider using it as we've suggested as an immersive experience at the beginning of fellowship to bring trainees up to speed. Um, or you could use it as a flexible faculty resource uh, to prepare for teaching specific geriatrics topics to trainees, getting everyone on the same page about the language and the resources. Um, and then finally, you can adapt materials from the cases in your teaching because someone's already done the work for you and found you know, a helpful table or a, or a good figure. Uh, and you can use that, especially when students have done those cases to build on their learning in an integrated way. So with that, I'll pass it back to Dr. Shah uh, and thank you all so much. Thanks, Dr. Schwartz, for a great, great presentation of uh, using it as for teach the teacher. Um, we did something very similar with our fellow um, and 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 had it as part of the boot camp, and it worked out really well. I think that you know it's hard to give lectures. Usually, I just have one or two or three fellows in most of our programs, and to spend all this effort to create a whole didactic um, series versus just letting them brush up this way has been really helpful. So, um, I'm going to move over and talk a little bit about. Um, about how we use uh, aquifer geriatrics with early learners, in other words, the preclinical learners, which I don't think at least uh, folks when they answered the poll uh, weren't doing yet. Um, and then with late learners, meaning like the resident learners, the, you know, uh, and how we're doing that here at Mayo. So the first course is a course that I direct, the Mayo Clinic Senior Stages Program. It's a longitudinal senior mentor type course. We use a, a learning management system. We use Blackboard. Um, they have discussions. They meet with their stages, et cetera, et cetera. One of these sessions was an advanced care planning one. And I demoed that case earlier and I referred that I'd be, be talking about that. And we, we used to have the traditional module, didactic, watch this video, you know, kind of thing, um, which can be kind of boring when you're talking about advanced directives. You know, if you're just talking about what is a living will and what is a pulse document, <laughs> et cetera. And we needed a more engaging way to certainly provide that important knowledge. So we changed this whole session around. We incorporated the Being Mortal book from Atul Gawande as a, as a pre-reading. Um, we changed the didactics to incorporate the case 27 uh, this year. Um, and, uh, and then we, uh, we bring it all together after they've talked with their senior mentor, their senior sage with a discussion. Um, and so I've been doing these small groups for a few years now, and it was pretty amazing to see how much uh, richer and deeper the discussions were. We were not having to repeat the basics of advanced directives because the students had all done their didactic. You know, we could track and see if they had completed the case. Um, the values history, we didn't have to explain how to do it, but we could talk about what they got hung up on when they were trying to do a values history because they had been role modeled it already with the videos and the uh, aquifer cases. And the other nice thing as an unintended benefit was that these are year two students um, and we use the aquifer cases a lot in the clerkship years, like many places do. Um, and so we got them all logins and they were all ready to go. And they already had this opportunity to get used to what aquifer is like um, so that they'll be able to hit the ground running in their clerkship years when they use it in pediatrics, central medicine, et cetera. Um, and so the basic tip for this is that, you know, think about aquifer geriatrics, though you may think of it for your clerkship, your clinical students, you could actually get them off on the right foot with teaching communication skills and some basic uh, clinical reasoning skills. Um, and, uh, and, and another way that you can do it is, is not by just assigning it for independent study, um, but by doing facilitated discussions in groups. So some faculty that I know at other uh, institutions have have um, done the case together over Zoom, for example, <clears throat> you know, uh, and and, uh, and and work through a case together and talk about it, talk about the clinical reasoning, just like you would a case uh, presentation at a morning report. Uh, but now you have structure and you have built in figures and, you know, you have built in teaching points that you can scroll to, uh, but explain to an earlier uh, student. And I'll answer more questions about that later um, in the Q&A. Um, for late learners, this is really simple. We have, uh, like many places, a geriatrics rotation for internal medicine residents. 
they all get to rotate through geriatrics for one month. We have a relatively small residency program in Arizona. And, and so we'd have one, we have one or two residents a month to create a whole didactic experience for them would be an enormous amount of faculty time. Um, and so what we have done, and so we used to just hand them like stacks of papers and read these and that sort of thing. And instead what we did was we, uh, we encouraged them to all complete at least one aquifer case, the prognosis and screening case. Um, because we talk, it's outpatient geriatrics, so we're talking a lot about these clinical decision making uh, around prognos prognostication and when do you decide to put that 80, through 80 year old through a colonoscopy or not. Um, and then we asked them, what are your prior geriatrics experiences at the medical school that you came from? Again, because of this heterogeneity. And then, oh, what did you not learn about? There's always something. Very few medical schools cover sexuality and aging, for example, or elder abuse and neglect. So, so there are always some cases that every resident, even if they went to a school that had a mandatory geriatric courtship, uh, finds uh, interesting. And these deep dives are really important, um, uh, you know, uh, in, in, uh, for residents. So we tell them, go, go, go deep into these and see how you might integrate uh, geriatrics uh, into the um, clinical care. And we refer to these. So when, I'm, when they're working with me in clinic, I say, remember, as the aquifer uh, uh, case talked about, you know, looking at life tables to look at prognostication, et cetera. So this has been much better received and we're killing much fewer trees and giving stacks of journal articles uh, for people to read um, or telling them to go to up to date. Um, it's much more efficient. Um, and it's been a really great use of downtime or filling time in the clinical schedule because there's always a half day here or there that a resident might need some, some, uh, uh, something uh, to be scheduled. So uh, these deep dives, and you can see that there's a little anchor here. There's a, uh, we're aquifer, so there's a lot of water analogies that you might find in our, in our, uh, in our, in, in, across our courses. Uh, but the deep dives are in our courses, and we've really used these maybe more than any other course because from the beginning, we knew that we wanted to have this for multiple groups of learners. Um, and, and, and oftentimes we wanted to teach additional details, but it wasn't relevant to every learner. It would be overwhelming. Um, and so these deep dives are really, really helpful. So for example, here's a deep dive on frailty, a little snippet from a section of it. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and we talked about using those deep dives with fellows. So, Let's go ahead and um, and head over to the Q and A period now. Um, for any of our uh, of our uh, folks, um, uh, I know that some people have put them into chat, and I don't see any in Q and A right now. We've answered a few in the chat. One question was for small programs, like if you're just trying to get a subscription for one fellow or one resident, you can get individual subscriptions for seventy five dollars per learner. Um, if you have uh, a good number of learners like 30 plus, it's better to do a institutional subscription. And we'll have some links for those of you who are not subscribers yet um, to walk you through all of that. Um, uh, and there's a, it's in the chat also um, at aquifer.org slash subscribe. Um, I know Ravi, there was a question for you during your section um, that asked about, uh, do you build in time for flipped classroom activities or just expect students to complete these on their own time during nights and weekends? Um, Dr. Ramaswamy, you wanna answer that? <laughs> sure, so thanks Pat for that question. So to answer your question, for the flipped classroom activities, uh, you know, the, the expectation is maybe one module, so it's less than 20, 25 minutes of, of, uh, of time. So we are not building that into their didactic time. The modules that we have students complete as part of independent learning, we do factor in uh, part of their didactic half day, we, we give them protected time to do that. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. So it's not a lot. So we also expect students to do some modules as part of their clinical experience. So let's say they're in geriatric inpatient rotation and they, they're asked to complete modules on delirium and hazards of hospitalization, uh, let's say. And those are, some are, uh, are uh, the students are encouraged to do them during their um, afternoons on service when they with the not seeing patients. And, and Ravi, I'll add for residents. Um, I actually I have I found flip classroom works for students, but I'm going to be honest for residents, they do not want to do it on the off time. And so I have used the concept of flip classroom, but have built that into the didactic structure. So that maybe for the first, let's say we have, I don't know, an hour and a half, maybe I have a longer time. And then the first half hour, they might spend in a small group or something, reading an article, doing a case, and then we'll use the second half of the structure. I think it depends on, 
your, what your what period of time that you are working with. Um, but we have found certain times it works and other times we need to build it into the didactic. But that's a very good question. Accountability is, is key. I would uh, call out students who didn't do their work <laughs> you know, in, you know, at the beginning of the group session. And some places use it in like formal TBLs fashion, you know, with a, with a quick quiz that gets students to pay attention and do their pre-work. But yeah, I, I would suggest uh, scheduling in the time to make it fair to students is really important. I agree with that, yeah. Um, there's a question from Sarah Ross. Is there an aquifer case for every non-geriatric clerkship, e.g. surgery, IM, FM, OBGYN, psychiatry, um, et cetera? So um, I can take that one, I guess. Um, uh, you know, uh, we do have that table um, um, that we link to each of the clerkships that's in the educator guide. Um, and so if you, uh, if you look at that guide, you'll see a table that will get you places. It's kind of obvious with some of them based on title, but with others, you really would have to go to learning objectives. So we've actually done that exercise to say, hey, you know, this would actually be a very good one. And so, yes, for all of the core clerkships at the you know, typical medical schools, we have at least one case, if not more, that would be very appropriate for use in, um, in each of the regular kind of core clerkship experiences in the medical school. And if I could, Dr. Shah, I'd like to just add to remind people that uh, in addition to that lovely chart that you have in the educator guide, if they go to that case search library that you demoed at the beginning, that's a terrific case. You can actually look by uh, the clerkship or course that you're teaching um, and you can find cases uh, related to older patients, related to neurology, for instance. Yeah, great, great point. Yeah, I didn't demo that part of, of that. So um, lots of different ways for you to find, um, to find some things in there. Um, we had a few questions that had been submitted um, earlier. Um, I'm just making sure that I think we got all the ones from the chat and from the Q&A. Um, Eileen, did you want to read some of those? I'd be happy to bring those forward for you. So we had one question just about how many cases are students assigned in a typical clerkship. I know, Dr. Shaw, you were talking about one example where one case was assigned, and Dr. Miller, you were talking about an example when six cases were assigned. Is there any typical number that you could talk about? I think, um, uh, Dr. Ramaswamy, do you wanna talk a little bit about your, since you're the, the sure, clerk sure. director, current clerk director on this Absolutely. call right now? <laughs> so in the pre-pandemic times, we, you know, like I, I, I briefly mentioned that, you know, we're lucky to have a very large department, lots of passionate clinician educators. Uh, despite that, aquifer modules have been super valuable to us. In the pre-pandemic, we, we had assigned between two to four modules, like I said, the, the, the topics that are not covered in didactics during clerkship. In the post-pandemic times, we are assigning a lot more modules because of limitations of space with you know, doing live didactics and so on. So we, we've been assigning about eight to 10 modules now over the course of the six weeks of, uh, of the clerkship. Uh, and it's uh, depending on what kind of clinical experience they're having in that particular week. Uh, during the during that workshop. Great. We've got another question here as well, and that's, um, are there uh, aquifer geriatrics? Oh, I just lost the question. I apologize. Um, training exams available. So we don't have in training exams available in aquifer geriatrics. But what's exciting is that we are having self-assessment questions that are coming in very shortly. So in January, you will see about 10 of our cases will have five self-assessment questions per case. So students who complete that case will have the opportunity to, 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 to answer five questions, uh, uh, to apply the knowledge they've gained from, from the module. Uh, and another strategy that educators can use is use one of these self-assessment questions as a trigger question to start off their flipped classroom, for instance. Um, you know, self-assessment questions, you know, it's only for the benefit of the students. So the, the educators will not know how the students did on these questions. Nevertheless, you have access to those questions that you can use in your teaching. Terrific. And I'm going to close yeah. us with one uh, last question, uh, which I think is super important. Then we'll move to the resources. And that question is, has Aquifer revisited the material to evaluate them for addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion? 
Yeah, so just like all of the aquifer cases, you know, all of the curricula have been reviewed. This has been published also with the race and culture group with a group of students that have gone through and has given us very specific feedback, um, um, you know, line by line editing sometimes, um, which we really appreciated, you know, because sometimes you've been looking at these cases for years and you you just don't see what you don't see. And um, it's been really amazing. Um, and, and that's been published in Academic Medicine, that paper, if you guys are interested, and someone can put that into the chat. Um, it's been it's been really nice. We we have taken great efforts to try to be representative in our cases to um, to to reflect um, uh, aging in all populations, um, you know, etc. But there's always work to be done. Um, we we um, with our new director's competencies, that's actually a very specific competency, and hopefully maybe we'll expand aquifer to include cases that really make that their major focus. Um, but I think it's something that should be integrated throughout all of aquifer cases. Terrific, thank you. Uh, and yeah. so I think that's probably all time we have for Q&A, Dr. Shaw, if you wanna- Yeah, uh, well, let me just share my screen again here. Um, and let us know if you guys have anything else, just reach out, you know, after the fact, sometimes as you're diving into things, you might not, um, you'll say, oh, I would, you know, really love, you know, so um, this is the, you know, uh, what are you gonna take home? You know, being uh, good educators, we have to make you commit to something that you've learned today. <laughs> so if you can put in the chat something that you're, you're gonna take forward or that you, that you, um, that, that you found to be helpful or, or that you might try out, um, that would be nice. Uh, so just throw that into the chat of what you might bring forward or what you might try out from the things that, and ideas that you've gotten here today. That would be nice, I think, for all of us to see. Um, there are lots of resources that are available in in um, in, uh, in aqueduct in in, in aquifer. Um, we've talked a little bit about educator resources and student learning resources, the educator quick guides. Um, there's also onboarding resources for your administrators and for your faculty. You know, how do I use this? Just all of aquifer uh, as a as a whole. Um, and so, and some really great demos about how you set up things, set up custom courses. You know, look at how student progress is. Um, uh, members of our Aquifer Geriatrics Board have created um, uh, videos. Um, uh, Dr. Mandy uh, Segel, who's um, uh, our, our teaching and learning lead, has has a nice little user story here. Um, some pearls and blog posts that have been mentioned already. Other webinars that are not just specific to courses, um, but also to just how to use Aquifer in general, especially during COVID and other times. Um, and other ways that you can make make the most use out of your um, subscription with some nice little resources. Um, we have the Aquifer has an amazing team um, that has helped to support this webinar and make it go off so well and um, and and just is really responsive. Um, so uh, talk with uh, if you have subscription questions with um, uh, Kate Hancock with Leah Romano. Their our consult uh, your, their information is here. We do peer consultations. I've done some of those. So just one on one. What are the issues you're dealing with at your institution? Uh, what are some ideas that we might have for you? And we can schedule some of those. We did a bunch of those during the COVID um, pandemic, and I feel like I learned as much about how creative ways that people were doing things at other institutions as as maybe they learned from me. And then I would feed that forward to other people as I met with them. Um, so um, I wanted to just thank you uh, to, to Dr. Ramaswamy, Dr. Schwartz, and Dr. Miller for taking time to share their wisdom with us and for all the dedication to aquifer geriatrics over the years. Um, also uh, to the, those who were not able to attend or part of our, our board. Um, I know I saw that, I think, I don't know if Katie's still on, but I saw that um, uh, uh, Dr. Dennis Dennison from Medical College of Wisconsin, who along with Dr. Ramaswamy worked on the uh, SAQ project uh, with the assessment um, uh, 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 part of, of aquifer um, have been key and in, in kind of the next greatest thing for aquifer geriatrics. Um, there are more webinars, um, including one coming up uh, December 9th. Uh, please register for that about lessons learned from COVID-19, uh, best practices for using all the aquifer virtual courses. Based on the responses here, maybe some of you can contribute to this webinar. Uh, since, since the majority of our participants today were actually using aquifer uh, geriatrics uh, during uh, the COVID pandemic to, to help to meet some of the learning needs. Um, so. Um, and connect with us, follow us on Twitter uh, at uh, aquifer.org um, and uh, reach out to any of us if you have any questions. We appreciate everyone's uh, time and attention on this post-holiday first day back. Thank you guys.